All right. Well, welcome to our second lecture on electrolyte solutions. And this is kind of the idea of a part two, because what we're going to follow up on is describing in more detail now the uh, concept of milliosmoles. And just as a reminder, what we covered in the first part, and it's still important for this lecture, is the relationship between the weight of something in terms of measuring an example in milligrams to its equivalent number of molecules, which would be millimoles. And previously, we've gone further to describe the chemical activity of those number of millimoles by calculating the milliequivalence by comparing and using the valence to determine the electrical charge. What we're going to do now is instead of focusing so much on milliequivalence and chemical activity, we're going to be calculating milliosmoles, which really focuses on determining the number of particles. Well, with that as our introduction, let's go ahead and define our very first important term, and that is the idea of a milliosmol. Milliosmol, which is abbreviated little m, capital O, S O S M O L, so for milliosmol, that is the unit of measure we're going to use for determining osmotic concentration. That is the amount of force produced by those number of particles in solution. Take home messages. Osmotic pressure measured in milliosmoles is dependent on the number of particles. All right, that pretty straightforward. If you understand that, then these calculations are really pretty straightforward. But let's start with the easiest example in terms of counting particles, and that would be for non-electrolytes. Okay, so in the case of a non-electrolyte, whatever number of millimoles, the number of molecules in, the, in millimoles that you have of that that chemical, so let's use dextrose as an example. If I have one millimole of dextrose and I put it into solution, it's non-ionic. It doesn't change. The molecule stays together. Nothing falls off of it. So you have the same number of particles as you do um, millimoles when you put it into solution. It's not ionic. In that case, one millimole of a non-ionic uh, chemical is going to have one milliosmol. The relationship is for every one millimole, you have one milliosmol. It's as easy as that. But keep in mind, this relationship only holds true for non-ionic particles. Okay? So let's do a question with that so you can kind of see this is pretty easy. The question says... A solution contains 2.5%, assuming weight per volume, of dextrose. And there's the chemical formula for dextrose, and it has a molecular weight of 180. How many milliosmoles per liter are represented by this concentration? As a hint, dextrose is non-electrolyte and therefore does not dissociate. All right. Well, let's draw a little bit of a roadmap here. So we have a volume, we have a liter, and of this we have a liter of a solution that contains 2.5% dextrose weight per volume. So I could come up pretty quickly with a certain weight of dextrose. What I need to would then do it would be to say, okay, well, it weighs that much, but how many molecules? Because I remember the relationship between um, for milliosmoles is that that for one milliosmole for every one millimole of a non-electrolyte. So I have to be in millimoles to be able to convert to milliosmoles. So let me take my weight of my dextrose, use my molecular weight, convert that to the number of molecules, and then I can relate the number of molecules to the number of millimoles. All right, so. That's, I'm trying to think through how I'm going to do this ahead of time. So here's the equation. Let's set it up. Remember, we're starting with the fact that we're going to be preparing or wanting to know how many milliosmoles in a liter of solution. So one liter is 1,000 milliliters. So let's start with 1,000 milliliters, and then we'll multiply it by the dextrose concentration expressed as 2.5 grams for every 100 milliliters. And again, that comes from the 2.5% weight per volume. Units of weight per volume are grams per mil, and percent means over 100. So 2.5 grams per 100 mils. Milliliters cancel, and I'm now in grams, or the weight of dextrose. Let me go ahead and at this point convert it to milligrams by multiplying by 1,000 milligrams on top for every 1 gram. So my units of grams cancel. Now I'm in milligrams, and I can convert that to millimoles because I know that for every one millimole of my dextrose, there would weigh 180 milligrams because that's the formula weight. Now milligrams cancel and I'm in millimoles. So this is kind of the key step to this idea. How do we relate the number of millimoles or the number of molecules to the number of milliosmoles? Well, again, since this is a non-electrolyte, you get one 
particle for every one millimole. Therefore, you get one milliosmole for every one millimole. So again, I set it up with that relationship. So my millimoles cancel and I would get um, milliosmoles as my final unit. And if you do the math from left to right, all the way across, your numeric answer would be 139 milliosmoles. Now, one other term to really make sure we're clear on is that we just calculated that the answer for this question was 139 milliosmoles. That was the osmotic force produced within a liter. So let's just make sure you're aware the term osmolarity means the number of milliosmoles per liter. Just like molarity means moles per liter, Milli, uh, um, I'm sorry, osmolarity refers to number of milliosmoles per liter. So that's the term that we'll use for that. Okay. Well, that was the easiest situation. Let's make it a little more complicated and start to look at, well, how do you calculate osmolarity or the number of milliosmoles when you have an electrolyte solution? Okay. In that case, remember the number of milliosmoles are going to be equal to the number of millimoles, the number of molecules, essentially the parent molecules, times the number of particles produced by that parent molecule. And let's just give an example, sodium chloride. Would you agree that sodium chloride as a parent molecule, you can have just one molecule of the sodium chloride stuck together. They're still stuck, stuck together, it's a solid. We haven't put them in water yet. So you would have one molecule of sodium chloride would have NaCl, one molecule. What happens though when you take that one molecule and put it into solution? Remember sodium chloride is an electrolyte, so they will dissociate. So the one parent molecule of NaCl becomes two particles, one sodium particle and one chloride molecule or particle. Remember since they're uh, electrolytes, they dissociate in water. So one parent molecule produces two particles. Therefore, the relationship would be for every one millimole of sodium chloride, you produce two milliosmoles. Essentially, you'd get one milliosmole from the sodium plus one milliosmole from the chloride. Therefore, you end up getting two milliosmoles from every one millimole of the parent compound sodium chloride. All right. Hopefully that kind of makes a lot of sense. So let's just, again, let's do the same sort of problem, but now using an electrolyte. So the problem says a solution containing 2.5% of potassium chloride with a molecular weight of 74.5, how many milliosmoles per liter are represented by this concentration? And again, the hint is that sodium chloride will completely fully dissociate into both sodium ions and chloride ions. All right. So let's set this up the same way. We still start with the fact that we want to know how much air present in a liter. So we'll start with 1,000 milliliters. We'll again multiply it by its concentration expressed as 2.5 grams over 100 milliliters. Milliliters cancel. I'm in grams. Let's convert that to milligrams by multiplying by 1,000 milligrams per gram. Units of grams cancel. I'm in milligrams. Now I convert from the weight of my sodium chloride to the number of molecules by multiplying by the fact that for every one millimole, there would be the formula weight of 74.5 milligrams. Milligrams cancel. And now again, I'm here in millimoles, the number of molecules of the sodium chloride parent molecule. So to convert that to the number of milliosmoles, I have to say, okay, sodium chloride, when it dissociates, will dissociate into one sodium and one chloride. So one plus one equals two. Therefore, there would be two particles or two milliosmoles for every one millimole. Millimoles cancel and I get um, milliosmoles for my final, uh, final unit. So if you do the math all the way across, you would get that essentially a thousand milliliters of this 2.5% potassium chloride solution would have the equivalent osmotic pressure of 671 milliosmoles. All right, so in determining osmotic force in the units of milliosmoles, we count the number of particles. And I know I'm really worried about you guys because it's easy to get counting particles confused with counting electrical charges like we did for chemical activity relating to milliequivalents. So this table, I think, does a really good job in saying, okay, in, 
in some cases, when we're doing chemical activity, we count valences and count the number of electrical charges. But when we are doing milliosmoles and are measuring osmotic force, we count particles, and they are not the same. And I think this table does a good job of illustrating that. So starting at the top, we can see the chemical uh, formula for dextrose. And dextrose is a non-electrolyte. So if you have one dextrose molecule, you have one particle, and you would have zero valence because it's non-electrolyte. There is no charge. Nothing comes apart from the dextrose molecule. So there is no electrical charge from a dextrose molecule, even though there's one particle. Okay? Let's take the example of potassium chloride. If you had one potassium chloride molecule... Okay, it would dissociate into two particles, one potassium and one chloride. So there are two particles. However, if we were doing Mela equivalent type questions, we would look at the valence and understand that the valence on the potassium and the chloride are one. Potassium is positive one, chloride is negative one, but the valence itself is just one. So in this example for potassium chloride, it would produce two particles, but only have one Mela equivalent based off of the valence. All right. Now look at magnesium sulfate. Again, magnesium sulfate is an electrolyte. You put it into solution and you would get one magnesium. You would get one sulfate. How many particles? Magnesium plus sulfate. That's two. So two particles are generated from one magnesium sulfate molecule. However, the valence on magnesium and sulfate is it's two. Uh, magnesium positive 2, sulfate negative 2. So the valence, the number of metal equivalents generated, if we count electrical charges, is 2, and the number of particles is 2. So you'll notice here they are the same. They haven't been the same up to this point, but in this one example they are the same. But let's keep going. Calcium chloride has the formula CaCl2. So when it dissociates, a calcium would come apart and you would have two chlorides. Calcium plus chloride plus chloride is 3 three particles. The valence, though, would be two because calcium is a plus two and chloride is a minus one, but there are two of those, so two, minus, two times minus one is two, so the electrical equivalence would be a two, the valence. All right, there we go. It does not match the number of particles again. And going on, just some last interesting ones, potassium citrate. And again, the citrate molecule has a valence of negative 3. Therefore, it takes 3 potassiums to bind to the, the citrate. When it falls, and when you put it into solution and it dissociates, you would get 3 potassiums and 1 citrate. So the number of particles would be 4. But the valence would be three because again citrate has a negative three valence. The potassium is negative or is positive one, but there are three of those. So again, three times one would be three. So the valence electrical activity is three, but the number of particles is four. And lastly, let's talk about calcium citrate. Once again, uh, citrate has a negative three valence. To combine that with calcium, which was a positive two, you'd have to have three calciums, three times two is six, positive, and you would need two citrates because minus three times two is six. So again, if we counted particles, you would have three calcium particles plus two citrate particles, so that's five particles altogether. But the fact that for either the citrate or the calcium, you have six charges. So the number of molecules times its valence would give you six. So it just it just kind of shows you that you they're, they're very counting these things are different. You either count particles or you count valence, but knowing one does not tell you the other. You need to basically be able to count and determine either one of those independently. All right, one last topic before we jump into all of our questions and really practice this concept. And that's simply, and I've mentioned already the term osmolarity, meaning the number of milliosmoles per liter. Another term that you may see printed on commercial products is osmolality. So osmolality is the measure of milliosmoles per kilogram of solvent, not per volume, but per kilogram of solvent. Whereas we said osmolarity is measured as the number of milliosmoles per liter of solution, meaning per volume. Okay, here's the deal. We're going to make some assumptions here that, that are generally true, that electrolytes in solution are generally completely dissociated. 
Okay. And that for dilute solutions where, uh, you know, and we, you know, and biologic concentrations and the, the IV products that we make are so really dilute compared to what you might do in a chemical lab or something like that, that these solutions and completely dissociate, they don't change the volume very much. So even when everything is dissolved and dissociated, they don't, the number of particles in there don't physically change the volume of the resulting solution. And if that's the case, then we can make this assumption that one liter of solution is essentially the same as one kilogram of solvent. And since we use water in biology and the density of water is one gram per mil, and as long as the dissolved solutes don't take up much physical volume, which isn't always the case when we do compounding and we make drug products, then the amount of powder can occupy and displace a certain amount of volume. But for are the electrolytes and at the concentrations we use to match by, you know, physiologic processes, they're very dilute and there's very little displacement of the volume. So we are going to make an assumption here that osmolarity and osmolality are going to be the same values. And these are acceptable for these sort of physiologic dilute solutions. And we only bring it up now because when you look at the labeling on some of your commercial products, do double check to see whether they're expressing it as osmolality or osmolarity. It could be labeled one or the other. But in general, for, for pharmacy examples, the values are essentially going to be the same. All right. Well, let's put all that knowledge to use. So let's go ahead and uh, answer this question. It says, for 147 milliliters of a 10% calcium chloride solution, and again, the formula for calcium chloride is CaCl2, and again, with two water, so it's essentially the dihydrate. It has a molecular weight of 147. So if we have 147 milliliters of this 10% solution, we want to calculate the number of millimoles, the number of milliequivalents of calcium, and the number of milliosmoles. So let's get started uh, and answer the first question. That will be fairly straightforward is let's determine the number of millimoles. All right. We would start with the fact that we have 147 milliliters of this solution. And the concentration they gave us was 10% weight per volume. So as a reminder, that would be defined as 10 grams for every 100 milliliters. We multiply and milliliters will cancel and we'll be in grams of the calcium chloride. Now let's convert that to milligrams by first converting over and multiplying by 1,000 milligrams for every gram. And then we will be in milligrams because grams will cancel. So we have essentially said that our 147 milliliters contains 14,700 milligrams of calcium chloride dihydrate. All right. Well, that's not what we want. We want molecules, man. So let's go ahead and multiply that answer by the fact that for every one millimole of calcium chloride dihydrate, it would have a weight of 147 milligrams because that's the formula weight for the uh, calcium chloride. So if we do that, we divide that out, we would have millimoles remaining. And again, you can see that it would be the, the numeric value would be 100 millimoles. So we've determined that 147 milliliters of this 10% calcium chloride solution contains 100 millimoles of calcium chloride dihydrate. Right? And that answers essentially question letter A. Let's go on now to letter B and determine the number of milli equivalents. So we would do that by taking the number of millimoles of calcium chloride and going ahead and determining the number of millimoles of calcium. You would do that by looking at the formula. So calcium chloride, or CaCl2, has one calcium molecule for every one molecule of calcium chloride. So we can set up the proportion and multiply it by the fact that there's one millimole of the calcium ion for every one millimole of the calcium chloride molecule. The millimoles of the molecule cancel, and now we're in millimoles of just the calcium ion. The last step to determine the chemical activity or the number of mill equivalents is to look at the valence, and the valence on calcium is positive 2. So let's multiply that and say that there are 2, the valence number, 2 milli equivalents of calcium for every 1 millimole of calcium. Millimoles of calcium will cancel, and again, our units would be in mill equivalents. So essentially, 100 millimoles of calcium chloride has 100 millimoles of calcium, which is equivalent of 2 milli equivalents of calcium. And that answers our letter B. The last step, and any most important for this new lecture, is let's determine the number of milliosmoles. Well, we would start back and look at the number of molecules of the calcium chloride dihydrate. And we said there was 100 millimoles of those. 
All right, let's count the particles. And remember, we are talking about the number of particles in water. So the two water molecules, the dihydrate, we don't count those. Those are water. We want to know the actual number of particles that are all floating around in our water. So let's just look at the calcium chloride. Calcium chloride will dissociate. It's, it's an electrolyte. And you would get one calcium molecule and two chloride molecules. So one calcium plus one chloride plus one chloride gives you three particles. Therefore, there are three milliosmoles generated from every one millimole of calcium chloride molecules. So that's the conversion factor we'll use. And if we multiply that across, millimoles of calcium chloride cancel. And our final units are in milliosmoles. And 100 times 3 is 300. So the final answer for letter C is that 147 milliliters of a 10% calcium chloride solution has produces 300 milliosmoles, okay, in terms of the actual number of, of force that it produces. Let's double check our answer. You'll notice on the top right, I've given you the package labeling for an actual commercial product for 10% calcium chloride. You can see where it says calcium chloride and it has one gram per 10 mils. And it's a 10 mil vial. But look on the right-hand side. The third paragraph down, it says that this commercial product, this 10%, has 2.04 milliosmoles per milliliter. All right. Well, we just measured out and calculated 300 milliosmoles. But I'll remind you that 300 milliosmoles was the amount of force produced by all 147 milliliters. So go ahead and do this. Take your 300 milliliters of, um, I'm sorry, 300 milliosmoles, divide it by 147 milliliters so that you get milliosmoles per milliliter, and you'll see that 300 divided by 147 gives you exactly 2.04. So our calculated result matches what's been labeled onto this commercial product. Well, let's keep going. The last question we measured just kind of milliosmoles for a set volume, the 147 mils. Now this question, we'll get back to kind of standardizing our expressions and actually determine osmolarity. So the question reads, what is the osmolarity, meaning the number of milliosmoles per liter, of a 10% dextrose with 0.45% sodium chloride solution? All right, and I give you three possible multiple choice answers, and you can kind of see a variety of different values depending on what kind of mistakes you make. So we're not going to make any mistakes, so let's just calculate this. I do give you some additional information that the dextrose that we used in the solution is the hydrous, and that only plays a role in terms of its molecular weight. Remember, we don't worry about the water molecules that come along as far as particles, but they will affect our molecular weight. So our drug that we're, you know, the dextrose we're using is hydrous dextrose with a molecular weight of 198, okay? And we're also using 0.45% sodium chloride. So as a reminder, sodium chloride has a molecular weight of 58.5. All right, so let's start counting particles and converting that into milliosmoles. Let's start with the dextrose. It wants to know the osmolarity. So we're going to standardize this for the amount of pressure produced for a liter, which is 1,000 milliliters. So let's start this calculation with 1,000 milliliters, then multiply it by the concentration of the dextrose, and that was given to us as 10%. Since that's a weight per volume, we would re-express that as 10 grams over 100 milliliters. Milliliters cancel and we're in grams, so now I know the weight of my dextrose. Let's convert that to milligrams by multiplying by 1,000 milligrams per gram. Grams will cancel. Now we're in milligrams. Remember, we want to convert that to the number of molecules. So let's multiply that weight by the fact that one millimole of dextrose would have a weight of 198 milligrams, since that's the formula weight for the dextrose. We're in molecules. We know the number of molecules. And remember, we said that dextrose is a non-electrolyte. So when we put it in solution, it's going to stick together. It's not going to dissociate. So we'll get one milliosmol for every one millimole. Therefore, now millimoles cancel, and we get milliosmoles. So you do that math all the way from the left to the right, and you should get a numeric value of 505, and the units would be milliosmoles. And remember, that was the number of milliosmoles per 1,000 milliliters or per liter. So that, I mean, that is uh, the osmolarity, but only of the dextrose. Remember, we don't just have dextrose in the solution. So the next step that we have to do is calculate the milliosmoles produced by our sodium chloride. 
Again, we'll standardize this per liter, so we're going to start with our 1,000 milliliters. Let's multiply that by the concentration of the sodium chloride in the solution, which we said was 0.45%. That means 0.45 grams per 100 milliliters. Milliliters will cancel. I'll be in my weight of sodium chloride. Convert that to milligrams by multiplying by 1,000 milligrams per gram. Grams cancel. I'm in my weight in milligrams. And let's convert that to millimoles by multiplying by the fact that there's one millimole for every formula weight, meaning 58.5 milligrams. Milligrams cancel. Boom. I'm back into my number of molecules. Now, Take a deep breath here. This is where, don't freak out on me, we talked about this. We said that sodium chloride, one molecule, one mole, millimole of sodium chloride, when you put it into solution, will dissociate into two things, a sodium ion and a chloride ion. Therefore, since you get two particles from one molecule of sodium chloride, we are saying there are two milliosmoles generated from every one millimole of sodium chloride. So that's why we put the two millimoles on top, milli, I'm sorry, two milliosmoles on top, over one millimole on the bottom, millimoles cancel, and you do the math from left to right, and your answer is 154, and the units again are milliosmoles. Now we can combine the two, because remember the total osmotic force that will be generated is the sum of all of the particles in the, in the solution. So we're getting 505 milliosmoles from our dextrose, we're going to add to that the 154 milliosmoles from the sodium chloride, and we can see that the total osmolarity of this solution would be 659 milliosmoles per liter. And that's the answer to this question. Lucky I still have more questions that we can answer. I know you're excited as I am, so let's do it. The next problem says... A hospital pharmacist fills a medication order calling for an IV fluid of 5% dextrose, and this time in 0.9% sodium chloride, and an additional 40 mela equivalents of potassium chloride. And all of these solutions and amounts are in a total volume of 1,000 milliliters. The IV infusion is administered through an IV set that delivers 15 drops per milliliter. The infusion has been running at a rate of 12 drops per minute, for 15 hours. Oh man, I'm already having information overload and I'm not done. I will just remind you that the molecular weight of potassium chloride is 74.5, the molecular weight of, of sodium chloride is 58.5, and the molecular weight of dextrose and the hydrous form of dextrose is 198. All right, so there's a lot of information here. Keep in mind, we have this IV fluid, and regardless of what's in it, it's been running at a certain rate of 12 drops per minute, and it's been doing that for 15 hours, so there's a certain amount of fluid that has been administered, okay? And this fluid, whatever volume that is, has certain concentrations. It's going to have 5% dextrose and 0.9% sodium chloride and some amount of potassium because there were 40 milliequivalents of potassium in a liter. So we have a concentration of potassium we could also use to determine how much potassium has been given. Okay? So take a deep breath and let's answer one question at a time. The first question asks, how many milliequivalents of potassium chloride have been administered? All right. Well, we have all of these concentrations and fluids and rates, but in the end, what determines what has been administered will be determined by the length of time something has been infused. So how long have we been infusing IV into this person? And remember, the question said for 15 hours. So let's start with that. So we answer this question by starting with 15 hours. The first step we have to do is convert that to minutes because our infusion rates and in, in drops per minute. So we got to convert it to minutes. So 15 hours times 60 minutes per hour will cancel the units of hours and now I'm in minutes. Now I can take time and convert that to drops because I know there are 12 drops per minute. I set it up that way so drops on top, minutes on the bottom, minutes cancel and now I'm in units of drops. Now I need to convert drops to volume in terms of milliliters. I was told that this IV set delivers 15 drops per milliliter. So now let's multiply it by the, uh, that rate, conversion by one milliliter on top for every 15 drops. And we put the 15 drops in the bottom so that the units would cancel. And now I'm in milliliters, thankfully. Okay. The last step is to convert the volume to the number of mel equivalents of potassium chloride by looking at its concentration. 
and they told us that we had 40 milli equivalents of potassium chloride in this liter bag, which is 1,000 milliliters. So if I put the 1,000 mils on the bottom, milliliters cancel, and my final units would be milli equivalents of potassium chloride. So if we do that math all the way from the 15 going from left to right, your final numeric answer should be 28.8, and the units would be milli equivalents of potassium chloride. All right. Let's take that information and go a little further because letter B wants to know, well, how many millimoles of potassium chloride have been administered? Well, let's use the answer we just had for the number of milliequivalents and convert that over to millimoles. So let's start with 28.8 milliequivalents of potassium chloride and use the fact that the valence on potassium and chloride is 1. Therefore, the electrical charges produced from that is 1. So you, you would have essentially for 1 millimole of potassium chloride, for one molecule, you would have 1 milliequivalent since the valence is 1. Milliequivalents will cancel, will be in millimoles, and we can see that our answer is 28.8 millimoles of potassium chloride. It's the same answer as our number of milliequivalents in terms of chemical activity because the valence and the charges are 1. So it's the same number. All right. Now we can convert to how many grams. Now that we know the number of millimoles of potassium chlorine that's been administered, let's convert that to the weight because the question is how many grams of potassium chloride have been administered. Well, let's start with the number of millimoles, 28.8 millimoles of potassium chloride. Let's multiply that by the fact that we know the relationship is that there would be 74.5 milligrams of potassium chloride for every one millimole of potassium chloride, since that's the formula weight. Millimoles cancel, and I'm in milligrams. Last step is to convert that to grams by multiplying by the fact that there's one gram on top. For every 1,000 milligrams on the bottom, milligrams cancel. My final units would be grams. Do the math going across, and your final numeric answer would be 2.15 grams of potassium chloride. And that essentially answers the first three questions. Now we're going to ask something about osmolarity in a minute, but up to now, hopefully you can see where, for all of these, and getting to osmolarity here in a minute as well, you have to be capable at going from milligrams or weight to millimoles, which is the number of molecules, to the chemical activity, which is the electrical charge or the valence, so the milliequivalents. So, so far, we've repracticed our milligrams to millimoles to milliequivalents. Now we'll take this a little further and practice with the milliosmoles. So, the fourth question on this is what is the total osmolarity of the IV fluid? In this case we all want osmolarity in the units of milliosmoles per liter. All right. Well, so there's three things in there, right? There's dextrose, there's sodium chloride, and there's the potassium chloride. So we're going to have to account for all of the particles in this solution to be able to calculate the total osmolarity. Well, let's start one thing at a time. Let's start with the dextrose and to count the number of particles. So we're gonna start with 1,000 milliliters times the uh, concentration, which we said was 5%, or five grams per 100 mils, mils cancel. Now I'll convert that to milligrams again. We'll have 1,000 milligrams per gram. So now I'm in the weight in milligrams. Convert that to the number of molecules by multiplying by one millimole over the formula weight, which was 198 milligrams, milligrams cancel. And at this point, I'm in the number of molecules. Again, since dextrose is a non-electrolyte, you get one milliosmole for every one millimole. And now millimoles cancel, and we multiply all the way across, and you see that that is equivalent to 253 milliosmoles. Let's do the sodium chloride. 1,000 milliliters times its concentration, which we said was 0.9%. So we'll take 0.9 grams per 100 mils. Units of mils cancel, I'm in grams. Multiply that by 1,000 milligrams for every one gram, so that grams cancel. Now I can multiply that by the relationship of one millimole has 58.5 milligrams, the formula weight for sodium chloride. Milligram cancels, and I'm in the number of molecules of sodium chloride. But because sodium chloride is an electrolyte, and you get one sodium and one chloride from every one molecule, sodium plus chloride, that's two, you get two milliosmoles from every one molecule. So we'll multiply by two milliosmoles per one millimole, and therefore our numeric answer multiplying across and dividing would give us a total of 308 milliosmoles. We're not done. We don't forget about the potassium chloride. 
So let's start with the potassium chloride. Now the amount we have for that that was put into the liter bag was the 40 milliequivalents. So we'll just start with 40 milliequivalents and convert it first to the number of millimoles. And we do that by looking at the valence. Potassium has a positive one and chloride has a negative one, so the valence is one. So that would mean one milliequivalent for every one millimole. So if I multiply by one millimole over one milliequivalent, then milliequivalents cancel and I'm in the number of molecules. And potassium chloride, just like sodium chloride, is an electrolyte. It dissociates into one potassium and one chloride, so you get two particles from every one molecule of potassium chloride, so two milliosmoles for every one millimole. Millimoles cancel, and we multiply across and get 80. And you would get 80 milliosmoles from the potassium chloride. So all we need to do at the end is to go ahead and add everything up. So let's start with the dextrose, which was 253. Let's add to it the 308 from the sodium chloride. And then lastly, the 80 from the potassium chloride. You add all that together and you get 641 milliosmoles. All right. And just to kind of confirm our work, what I show you just above that answer is kind of a blow up on that label that I showed you on the previous slide for this actual commercial product. And you can see down below there that we got 641, which is essentially the same as their 640 milliosmoles per liter that they got on that question. All right, the last question as it relates to this problem that we've been dealing with, letter E here says, compared to normal serum osmolality, is the solution hypoosmotic, isoosmotic, or hyperosmotic? What is the tonicity of this solution? Okay. So this goes back to what I alluded to at the very first slide is that isn't osmolality, osmolarity, and we're again going to mix those two terms together since we can essentially say they are the same for our solutions. Osmolality, osmolarity, isn't that the same measure as tonicity? And I'll remind you, we talked about with tonicity, you could have less than the uh, amount of osmotic force produced by biologic tissues like blood or serum or lacrimal fluid. And if you have less osmotic forces, it was called hypotonic. If you had the same as biologic fluids, it was called isotonic. And if you had more particles in the concentration in the solution, it was called hypertonic. Well, you can have the same, you can have the same descriptions for osmotic, hypoosmotic, isoosmotic, or hyperosmotic. What is the difference? And it's, it's a very subtle difference, to be honest with you. They are related. They are talking about measuring the amount of force, osmotic force, produced by the number of solutes in the solution. Okay? The diff so, the, again, that what makes them the same is the fact that it's the number of forces measured across a semi-permeable membrane. Remember, this whole idea is that you've got concentrations of, of things within a cell, and we're comparing it to the concentration of stuff outside of the cell in the solution. And what divides the inside of the cell from the outside of the cell is this semi-permeable membrane, okay? Where they are different is the fact that when we are talking about hyperosmotic, isoosmotic, or hypoosmotic, we are talking about the concentration effect of particles that either are impermeable or are penetrating. We don't distinguish between the two. So this concentration of items might include some things that can't diffuse across the membrane, but could also include ones that could. So an iso or a hyperosmotic solution might have a force both fluid across, but not only will fluid maybe go across the cell, but some of the particles will go across the cell, and both of those things will help e equalize the pressure. Whereas when we're talking about a hypertonic solution, that tonicity is produced by particles in solution that cannot freely penetrate the membrane. Therefore, there will be no change or movement of solutes across the membrane. The only thing that can move is the water. Okay, So that is the difference. Ice, the os osmolality or osmolarity includes the pressure, but pressure produced by particles that may or may not cross across the membrane. Whereas tonicity is the force produced by particles that we know cannot do that. Okay. So uh, the, as a result of that, so think about this. The, last, the third bullet point down there says a solution can be both hyperosmotic due to having an increased number of pressure, doing to have a bunch of penetrating sol solutes, 
and isotonic because when you put that solution against the cell, not only will water move, but essentially particles will move into the cell, essentially equalizing it. So it can be that while the solution is hyperosmotic, since what's causing those uh, osmotic forces can pass membranes, they can equalize the pressure when you put them against membranes. So when you actually compare them to biologic fluids, then the pressure can equalize and become isotonic. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure that's a great explanation. Hopefully you understand. It's a subtle difference, but isotonic is absolutely impenetrable molecules. Osmotic, hyperosmotic, hypoosmotic include particles that can potentially cross the membrane. Therefore, when we the answer about whether or not those osmotic solutions are tonic or not depends on what the final result is relating to the non-permeable particles. Okay. In this example, we were asking about this solution. Our solution here that we've been doing it is hyperosmotic, remember, because of its high osmolarity. It had 666 milliosmoles per kilogram or milliosmoles per milliliter, if we consider it to be osmolarity. And that would be compared to a normal value. So normal osmolality would be 275 to 300. We're way up there at 666. So clearly, our solution is hyperosmotic. Okay. Our solution is ice, also hypertonic because everything in our solution, the sodium and the chloride and the potassium and the chloride and the dextrose, all of those things, okay, all of the electrolytes, if you will, are polar and they're not going to be able to just act, you know, just passively diffuse across the membrane. The cells work really hard to regulate the movement of sodium, potassium, and chloride. So it doesn't freely diffuse across. So those things aren't going to be freely diffusible. And the dextrose is a big old large molecule. It doesn't pass through there. So everything in our solution is essentially non-permeable or non-penetrating. So the forces it produces are the equivalent of are the same as tonic effects. And since it was, you know, high in concentration, it's going to be essentially a hypertonic solution as well as hyperosmotic. And that's going to always be the case. They'll be the same when what's causing those forces in solution are non-permeable particles. One last question, but it is a doozy. So let's just get it over with. The problem says, calculate the concentration of each electrolyte in the essentially milliequivalents per liter or millimolar, so milliequivalents per liter, and also the total osmolarity in milliosmoles per liter. Okay, so we want uh, millimolar and milliosmolar. Uh, concentrations. And we're going to do this for the commercial product called lactated ringers for injection. Okay, this is a not uncommonly used solution that we'll put drugs in and try to use in different situations. And actually, if you were to zoom in and look at the little bitty text onto that bag, what it says is that in this lactated ringers for injection, each 100 milliliters contains 600 milligrams of sodium chloride with its information there. 310 milligrams of sodium lactate, and that's the reason why it's called lactated ringers, because there's lac lac lactate in it. Also 30 milligrams of potassium chloride and 20 milligrams of calcium chloride. And again, it's the dihydrate. All right? Each of these amounts are the standardized per 100 milliliters. And the first thing we're going to address, and we're going to do answer all of this. We're going to calculate the number of equivalents per liter and the osmolarity produced by those particles one at a time, and then we'll add them up in the end. And so let's just start with the sodium chloride, okay? So remember, what we are wanting is the number of milliequivalents and the number of milliosmoles per liter. So let's start with 1,000 milliliters. That's how much we're going to standardize this for. So we'll start with 1,000 mils and multiply it by the concentration of the sodium chloride in our lactated ringers, which we said was 600 milligrams for every 100 milliliters. Milliliters cancel, and I'm in milligrams of sodium chloride. Let's convert that to the number of molecules. So we'll multiply that by one millimole over its formula weight, which is 58.44 milligrams. Milligrams cancel. If I do that math, I get 102.7 millimoles. Okay, that's the number of molecules. We're going to use that number here in a minute, but let's go ahead and finish out the, and actually calculate the number of milliosmoles. 
because as we've said before, one sodium chloride molecule will uh, dissociate into one sodium and one chloride, which is two particles. So let's multiply the 102.7 millimoles times the fact that there are two millimosmoles for every one millimole. Millimoles cancel, and you can see already what we know is that the sodium chloride concentration itself in this bag will produce 205.4 milliosmoles. All right, and that would be per liter. But we also wanted to know the number of milliequivalents. So let's go to the sodium. So let's break this down. So we have 102.7 millimoles of sodium chloride. Okay. That would, since there is one sodium for every one sodium chloride, we would also have 102.7 millimoles of sodium. Okay. So since we have that number of molecules of sodium, let's multiply it by its valence. So again, the valence on sodium is one. So the chemical activity would be one milliequivalence. Valence goes with milliequivalence. One milliequivalence for every one millimole. Millimoles cancel. And we can see that I get 102.7 milliequivalence of sodium from this amount of sodium chloride. However, there's also chloride in there. And if I start with 102.7 millimoles of sodium chloride, and there's one chloride for every one sodium chloride, I also have 102.7 millimoles of chloride. How many milliequivalents of chloride am I getting? Well, the valence on chloride is also one, so we'll multiply by one milliequivalent for every one millimole, millimoles cancel. Notice I get 102.7 milliequivalents of calcium. I also get 102.7 milliequivalents of sodium. And lastly, the combination of all of those produced 205.4 milliosmoles of osmotic pressure. So those are our answers just for the sodium chloride. Now let's repeat this whole process for our other three ingredients. Okay, So let's start now with the sodium lactate. I'm going to set these up exactly the same. I'll try to go through them a little more quickly. But we're going to do everything we just did, but for each one of these particles. So again, sodium lactate, you can see the formula there. We're going to start with 1,000 milliliters times its concentration, which is 310 milligrams per 100 milliliters. Milliliters cancel. Let's convert it to molecules by multiplying by 1 millimole over its formula weight of 112.06 milligrams. Milligrams cancel. Boom, I'm 27.7 millimoles. All right. Now, let's convert that to milliosmoles. Let's book, look back at the molecule. For sodium lactate, you'll see that it has one sodium for one lactate. Sodium is positive one, lactate is negative one, so for every one molecule of sodium lactate, you have a one sodium and a one lactate. Okay. Therefore, you get two particles. So once again, we can multiply this by the fact that there are two milliosmoles for every one millimole, since there are two particles. So the total milliosmoles produced by the sodium lactate is 55.4 milliosmoles. Now, let's go back and take our millimoles down again. And again, I was being a little more precise here. We have 27.67 millimoles of sodium because there's one sodium molecule for every one molecule of sodium lactate. So now we can multiply it by its valence, which is one milliequivalent over one millimole. So we get 27.7 milliequivalents of sodium. We'll do the same thing for lactate. Again, we had the 27.7 millimoles times the valence on the lactate is one. So one milliequivalent for every one millimole. Millimoles cancel and we get 27.7 milliequivalents of lactate. Okay, so that amount of lactate, the sodium lactate gives us itself 20. Didn't we already get some sodium equivalents, milliequivalents? Yes, but that sodium was from the sodium chloride. Now we are also getting 27.7 milliequivalents of sodium from the sodium lactate. We also get 27.7 milliequivalents of just lactate, and then both of those contribute 55.4 milliosmoles of osmotic pressure. All right, we're halfway done. Let's keep going. So the next one would be for potassium chloride. 1,000 milliliters of this solution times the 30 milligrams per 100 milliliters, which comes from the concentration that we were given. Milliliters cancel. Let's convert it to moles by millimoles by dividing by the formula weight of 74.55 milligrams. I'm in essentially four millimoles. Convert that to osmotic pressure. Let's look over at the potassium chloride. One molecule will produce one potassium and one chloride. So again, two particles for every one molecule. So we'll have two milliosmoles for every one millimole. Four times two is eight. So we get eight milliosmoles from our amount of potassium chloride. 
Let's calculate the milliequivalents. So we'll start with the four millimoles. And again, we have one potassium for every one potassium chloride. So we have four millimoles of potassium times its valence, which is one. So one milliequivalent per one millimole, we get four milliequivalents of potassium. Same thing for chloride. We have four millimoles of potassium chloride is four millimoles of chloride since there's one molecule in potassium chloride times its valence, which is one milliequivalent over one millimole. We have four milliequivalents of chloride. So based off of the amount of potassium chloride in there, it will generate four milliequivalents of potassium, four milliequivalents of chloride, and both of those contribute to eight millimolar, I'm sorry, eight milliosmoles of osmotic force. Last one is potassium chloride, and this is where things might get a little bit different. So let's slow it down just a little bit to make sure we don't make any mistakes. It's done the same way. Well, you'll see what's a little different here in a minute, but let's start with the same 1,000 milliliters and multiply that by the fact that we have 20 milligrams for every 100 milliliters, so milliliters cancel. Let's convert it to molecules by multiplying by one millimole over its formula weight of 147 milligrams, milligrams cancel, and I have 1.36 millimoles. So that's the number of molecules I have. Now, be careful, let's count the number of particles. Again, we're not worried about the dihydrate or the water molecules, that's water in water, so it's really just the rest of the dissolved solutes. So calcium chloride as a electrolyte will dissociate into one calcium and two chloride. So again, calcium plus chloride plus chloride is three. So now let's, we need to multiply this by the fact that there would be three milliosmoles for every one millimole. Millimoles cancel, and you'll see that the calcium chloride produces 4.1 milliosmoles. Let's calculate the mill equivalents by going back down to the calcium. And again, since there's one calcium in every one calcium chloride molecule, and we had 1.36 millimoles, so we have 1.36 millimoles of calcium. Now, be careful, we have to multiply times its valence. Here, calcium's valence is a positive two. There are two electrical charges for every one molecule. So there would be two milliequivalents for every one millimole. So we multiply that and we would get a total of 2.7 milliequivalents of calcium. All right, let's go back down to the chloride. We I remind you we had 1.36 millimoles of calcium chloride. And in this case, I'll remind you, we are going to convert that to chloride, but there are two chloride molecules for every one calcium chloride. So I'm going to multiply that by the fact that there would be two millimoles of chloride for every one millimole of calcium chloride. And you can hopefully see that because it's CaCl2. There are two chlorides for every one calcium chloride. So that's why we multiplied by two there. We're in the units of millimoles of chloride. Let's convert that to its electrical or its chemical activity by looking at the valence. The valence on chloride is one, so there would be one milliequivalent for every one millimole. And if we multiply that across, units cancel, and we would be essentially 2.7 milliequivalents of chloride. So again, 2.7 milliequivalents of chloride with 2.7 milliequivalents of calcium, and those two combined produce 4.1 milliosmoles of osmotic force. So we've done a lot of individual work at this point. So let me just go ahead and let's add it all up because what it wanted was to calculate the concentration of each electrolyte in milliequivalents per liter and the total milliosmolarity, okay? So going back, from the sodium, we have essentially sodium from the sodium chloride, which was 102.7, plus the sodium from the sodium lactate, 27.7. Add those together, and the total would be 130.4 milliequivalents. And remember, all of this was standardized per liter, so that's the amount per liter. Potassium only came from the potassium chloride, so that was a total of 4 milliequivalents. Calcium only came from the calcium chloride, so it was just 2.7 milliequivalents. And then lastly, the chloride, though. Chloride came from the sodium chloride, which was 102.7. It also came from the potassium chloride, which was 4. And it also comes from the calcium chloride, which was the 2.7. So you add those three values together, you should get a total of 109.4 milliequivalents for the chloride. And then lastly, there was only one source for the lactate, and that was the 27.7. So those are all of the concentrations of all of our electrolytes in the uh, units of milliequivalents per liter. Lastly, let's add up the total osmolarity. So from the amounts caused by the sodium chloride, that was a 205.4, plus the 55.4 from the uh, sodium lactate, 
plus the 8 from the potassium chloride, plus the 4.1 from the calcium chloride. So you add all that together, you get a total of 273 milliosmoles. And again, that would be essentially per liter or osmolarity. Hopefully you saw where all of those numbers came from. I kind of got, it got a little bit repetitive, but that's where once you are strong in being able to set up these uh, equations and be able to multiply across and watch your units, I can't fool you. It's the same process over and over, just a different chemical entity in, that you're trying to use. But let's see, did we get the answer right? Because remember how I told you that I kind of squished up the bag there so you couldn't see that little bitty text? Let me show you. I'm just basically going to blow up the text that is on that lactated ringer's bag. And it's kind of cool to see that the way we just set up these equations and solve for it gives us the right answers because look at the way it's labeled. It says on the end of the first sentence on top, it says electrolytes per 1,000 milliliters, okay, includes sodium 130, compare that to our 130.4, potassium of 4, compare that to our answer of 4, calcium is 3, compare that to our answer of 2.7, chloride 109, compared to ours of 109.4, Lactate of 28 compared to our 27.7. And again, keep in mind, only those differences are the fact that we didn't round and they rounded all their numbers. So we got exactly the same answers. It's kind of cool. And more importantly, let's look at the osmolarity. We basically see their value was 273 milliosmoles per liter. What did we calculate? 273 milliosmoles per liter. So it's kind of reassuring to know that once you learn these skills, this is what's important. When you work in a hospital and you're basically infusing and, and diluting your drugs or replacing fluids with all of these IV solutions, if you understand these concepts and can do this math, then you'll understand them at the, the solutions and the, and the drugs that you're dispensing in the hospital. So hopefully you found this uh, lecture helpful.